were four or five people that we knew were in the leather. <laughs> well, first thing I'll say, it's changing. It is getting better. I have to say that. There's still a lot of discrimination there. But in the 60s and 70s, a leather queen from the rest of the gay community was just probably the most derogatory term you could call somebody. And right above us were the drag queens. And at that time, even the frayed floats and everything that were in the parades, I mean, the leather, they're always trying to put the leather and the drag queens way back. The drag queens got out more because they were out there. But as far as leather, they'd always put us at the end of the parade, hoping that the, the press had gone by that time. Another example was most of the en entries in the parade, and I'm talking about past, not current, uh, were commercial vehicles. Just, you know, somebody rented a thing, they did their own decoration of it. At the time, the Gold Coast, the only leather bar around, made extensive, the artist ATN created some absolutely beautiful floats, uh, a great big boot, uh, a concentration camp. Uh, oh, I could just go on and on on what they had. We never won a war, never. And uh, one of the guys that was uh, part of that uh, committee died now. Uh, always said, Chuck, quit trying to win. You're not going to win. Too many of the committee don't like the leathers. They think they're perverts. And that, that prevailed for years. Only lately, since international leather and that has started to bring it up and the public awareness is getting much higher, we don't get the discrimination blatant as we did before. And i got to emphasize blatant because there's still a lot of discrimination there. You know, I don't, can't ever remember a leather man, for instance, in Chicago, which is considered probably the leather capital of the world, since everything is here. I can't ever remember a leather man, say, being uh, the marshal of the gay pride parade here. I was marshal of the San Diego parade. <laughs> so it just shows you the difference. You know, there's just tremendous mark. The discrimination today is extremely subtle. San Francisco, uh, I don't know who's been in their parade in that, but I know that they're always seem to be pushed to the background. And nobody's coming out today because we've got too much acceptance and saying we don't like leather people, they're perverts, which people used to say constantly. But it's very, very subtle. I mean, you know, not recognizing, uh, as you said, a, a leather um, documentary. Uh, just, I mean, it's, it's, but it's, it's efficient, don't get me wrong. But it's extremely subtle. I mean, uh, we just don't get in, invited to different things. Uh, I'm, for instance, I never get invited to a lot of the, the uh, political fundraisers and kind of being a leather man, you know. Uh, I can give you a good story about way back again, and, and that is that uh, <clears throat> George Dunn, who at that time was the Cook County Chairman of the Democratic Party, called me in and asked me to run as a um, run for office. I don't know what it was. I think it was probably a committeeman or something. But anyway. And, uh, and we sat there talking, and I said, George, I'm a leather man. I said, so people are going to tear you apart for that. They're going to say that people are, where we beat people up and everything else. I said, I think I would hurt you, myself, the gay community, and the Democratic Party. He looked at me for a while, he thought, I said, would you run for delegate for Dead Kennedy? <laughs> but that just shows you that the, the, it's subtle, it's very subtle. It's changing, I will say that, I have to say that, but there are some people that just die hard against us because people don't understand us. Somebody says a leather man, BDSM. The minute they hear that, you know, bondage, discipline, sadomasochism, they think, oh my God, what are these people all into? They're getting beat up and tortured. And, and, but it's lack of understanding what's really happening. They don't understand, and most of it's symbolic. I'm not saying there isn't some pain involved, there is. But it's still basically symbolic. I remember one time somebody told me that, uh, oh, I went after so-and-so with a horse whip. And I said, that's bullshit. No, it's not. I just said, okay, let me prove you something. I took a leather pillow and took a horse whip and hit the pillow with it. I split it in two. <laughs> but it, it's those subtle things. It's very hard to, to document them because, they're, once again, they're subtle. Publicly, gay leaders were saying, Oh, we shouldn't have drag queens in the gay parade. We shouldn't have leather people in there. It's a negative influence on the straight community to us, and they think the wrong thing about us. And yes, a lot of the gay people still think that, and a lot of the gay community still just extremely, uh, it was, has extreme animosity towards us. There's no question about that. It's once again, people don't understand. I think if they stopped and think, 
they wouldn't feel that way. I mean, you know, led the community to the worst one, the first one for safe, sane, consensual sense. I mean, it, it, sex. It would, it just no, no doubt about it. You know, we, we've advocated so many things. I mean, one of the Leathermen here who simply died. It was the head uh, uh, judge for IML for years. I mean, he established Chicago House for the AIDS patients. Uh, myself, I helped with the uh, establishment of an AIDS thing in the Illinois Masonic Hospital. But they don't stop to think. All they think of, oh, people are beating people up. <laughs> and that's really what they stop to think. And a lot of people just don't care. And they don't think. They hear what their neighbor says. They hear something else and they go, oh, man, you know. i give you kind of another example. Now, this is going back again. But one of the uh, liquor commissioners called me in and he said, well, you know, we've got a lot of reports of you torturing people and people in chains and stuff in your bar. And this was the liquor commissioner. And I talked to him and I tried to explain what it was. And uh, I said, why don't you come in and look at the bar? I said, what you're saying is true, what people are telling you. You're going to see people on crutches and bandage and everything else, you know. He did. He came in. And at the bar he said to me, this is a very pleasant place, I like it. And we have no more problems after that. But that just goes to show you how far up some of that animosity can be, ta be taken. Metropolitan Community Church, which to me is very important. It saved people from all the Catholic uh, and other hypocrisies. Troy Perry, Leatherman, and he started the church, you know. If you stop and think, there's an awful lot of us leather people that are in there. My own was probably just living my life openly and outside as a gay leather man, and never, letting, never hiding it for any reason whatsoever. I think that went a long way with a lot of politicians and a lot of other people. Uh, just to give an example, in one Chicago, uh, not Chicago House, I'm sorry, uh, but the community on also the leather thing was done. Some of the people who were in there did not come to ask me if I would promote anything there. But Patrick, I don't remember his last name, but he was the big financial genius raising the money. He came to me and said, I want to name the men's locker room after you. You've done so much. And I said, fine. And he did. I made a contribution. But the point of it is that he came forward to it. A lot of other people wouldn't. Most of the t things I gave or the thing I gave were speeches, I made at IML uh, against uh, crystal meth and barebacking. For a number of years, I have challenged our community to battle the forces that have endangered our lifestyles, from AIDS to barebacking to crystal meth. And I must say, you have all rallied to the battle. We have not won, but we are making progress. Uh, barebacking, <laughs> it got quite a stir in the gay community and in the leather community, but I stuck to my guns and did it. And I have to say this, as far as I know, the leather community, the crystal meth use is way down. I'm sure it's still there. But we don't have any cases anymore of the police being called or people passing out at the hotel and kind of crystal meth. That's all gone. Barebacking, I think, is way, way down. A lot of the barebacking pornos and that are not, are just out of business. They're not doing it. But that's once again speeches I gave and things at International Mr. Leather. But don't forget, International Mr. Leather is a, kind of a bully pulpit for the United States. Those guys. Those leather guys that come here are from all over the country, and as a matter of fact, from all over the world. And I, my message, or our messages, is always carried back to mainstream gay communities, and they listen. In a way, it's kind of humorous, you know. It's like saying, well, why are you persecuting somebody who's saving you? <laughs> and that, that's kind of the way it is. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I can go on and on naming things that the leather community has done and is foremost in it. Uh, the leather community was foremost coming forward in AIDS and research for AIDS. Uh, oh, it, you know, that just goes on and on. And even the leather women were into it. You know, I'm not when I say leather community, I don't mean just gay leather men. I'm also meaning the leather women. There's fewer of them, of course, but uh, they're just as important. You know, when AIDS hit, the community, the lesbian community, and especially the gay lesbian community came. The gay leather lesbian community came highly forward for gay men. They took care of them, they took them in. It was amazing. I wanted a meeting with gay rights. At that time I owned Gay Life newspaper and I wanted to do an interview with her and try to get a hold of the mayor of the city of Chicago. I don't care who it is. 
you call up, you know, you make an appointment, it'll be screened by a committee, and I could never get in to see her. So I thought, well, I'm going to try something. So I called up her husband, who was a reporter for the, I believe the Sun-Times, I'm not sure. And I told him, oh, Jay, I want to take you to dinner or lunch. And he says, what for? I said, well, I own Gay Life, and I'm trying to get to your life. He laughed. And he said, uh, who's paying for lunch? <laughs> So I went where we had lunch at a restaurant downtown called Mayor's Row across from City Hall. And after lunch, he paid by the way, after lunch we went across the street, walked right into the mayor's office. And I asked her, I says, uh, uh, Miss Mayor, would you uh, have an interview with us? And she said, yeah. And a week later, I brought my reporter and we interviewed. Now during the interview, I said, her, would you sign a proclamation forbidding the discrimination of gay people in city employment? And she says, yes. And it just kind of floored me because usually you get a political answer. You know, we'll have to think about it and whatnot. She just said yes. And the next thing I said, well, when? And she said, next month is Gay Pride Month. I'll sign it for them. And she did. And I have the original proclamation. But that was for the entire gay community. But there's an example. Myself, my reporter, both of us, another men, in there talking to her about gay rights. Now it's later on, I mean, that was the forerunner of the beginning of it. Now, I mean, it's past the city council and everything. There's no discrimination, period, in the city of Chicago, legally. <laughs> Which is why, again, that what discrimination does exist is extremely subtle. You know, if I could prove that somebody in the gay pride parade, or any gay pride parade anywhere, was discriminating against us because we were little men, that'd be a lawsuit. <laughs> so, of course, it's subtle. And they know that, you know. It's getting better, I have to say that. What's also interesting, too, is that the leather community and the fetish community, heterosexual, are joining kind of, and they're getting more and more known of each other, and there's more intermingling. And that's good, because there's power in unity. It's the leather community and the lesbian community and the heterosexual fetish communities all get together. There's a lot more power there and a lot more votes. See, I've been invited to speak at Leather Sins, which is a heterosexual SM group. And I've been, in fact, I've been to speak there, I think, twice already now. And yeah, and there does not seem to be, from the heterosexual leather community or fetish community, there does not seem to be any amnesty towards us at all. I went there one time with a boyfriend and had sex in the play space with all these heterosexuals. And there wasn't even people staring, saying, ooh, ah, or anything. It was just accepted. The same reason that the gay community is getting more and more perceived, and I believe that's knowledge to knowing it, knowing about it, knowing your brother or somebody is a leather man, that all helps. I really think that more people are educated and understand what we do and how we do it and what we've done and what we stand for, the greater the appreciation and acceptance is going to be. But once again, a lot of people, they're prejudiced, you know. But you don't forget, even in the straight community, there's people prejudiced against the gay community yet. And yet we're talking about gay marriage. Yet there are states that are constant, they're changing their constitution uh, against gay marriage. And then another state, New York, just okayed it. So it, it's hard to say, but it is getting better. But there's still animosity. I think there'll always, I don't care what it is, there will always be some animosity towards the leather men, towards gay men, towards leather women always some. But that's not the important thing. As long as it's a minor and fractional part of society, we're okay. But it'll always be there. There's no question about that.